Теперь раз, два, три. Раз. Раз, раз. Раз, два, три. I'll do longer introduction. Uh, excuse me, if you can hear. Um, so I'll make a little bit longer than planned introduction, hoping that some others <laughs> will still come. But uh, in the interest of all of your time, I'd like to start the session. This is the workshop. Nine, number 92, the role of internet-based services for the disaster communications. Um, this workshop is or, um, hosted by the following organizations, APNIC, Asia Pacific Network Information Center, AAPT Foundation from Indonesia, um, the oops, China Education and Research Network, CERNET, and DOTO Asia organizations, they are busy for other sessions. And Japan Internet Providers Association, he is representing, uh, I'm sorry, APT and APG, um, he is representing. And f uh, finally, not last but not least, is Information Support Pro Bono Platform, which I represent. Um, today we are very fortunate to have five experts, oops, four experts and myself, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> on the disaster communications. Um, let me introduce to the far left, Mr. Valens Riadi. He is the founder of Airputti Foundation and also head of the National Internet Registry uh, of, of the Indonesian ISP Association we call APSI in short. And then, unfortunately, the original speaker, Ms. Naomi Shibuya, couldn't make it for some personal reasons, but we are lucky to have Toshi Tateishi he is the Vice Chairman of the ISP Association of Japan, or JAIPA. Um, then there, uh, Mr. Kurt Elric, linguist, am I right? Yep. Uh, he's the CEO of NetNord, um, Sweden's um, national internet exchange, as well as supporting other internet infrastructures at large. And then Mr. Ben Scott, he's the advisor at the Open Technology Institute of the New America Foundation. 
Um, and myself, let me introduce Izumi Aizu. I'm the co-director of the ISPP, or Information Support Pro Bono Platform, which is a nonprofit started um, April last year after the disaster. So today I'd like to um, just show you some format that I'll make some brief presentation of what happened uh, in Japan and how people used or couldn't use the information tools and the sources. Uh, we did some survey on that. Followed by that is uh, Toshi will give you another presentation about how the ISPs had to face and overcome the very severe situation. And then we go back a little bit um, in history that I will invite Mr. Riadi to talk about the Aceh tsunami experience or your relief works with the ICT right after. And his continued activities till now, which took the lessons from the first catastrophe and moving forward. And then we have, um, uh, excuse me, Kurt. Um, he will share his experience of some disaster happened in Sweden and how they try to overcome or manage that. And last but not least is Ben will talk about ad hoc um, wireless networking, um, which would have been very effective for the Hurricane Sandy, but uh, their experiences and as it, I think it provides a very interesting alternative model about the communication for the disaster management, but also other applications, uh, if not to replace the entire infrastructure. Uh, with that, if I may, I'd like to start my short presentation. Uh, there's the screen. Uh, oops. Oops. Um, first of all, after 20 months, uh, things are not really getting better. Uh, Sylvia went to the site just a few months ago, and she can testify perhaps later. Uh, the, I would say that the natural disaster is becoming more of a social disaster. Uh, recovery is very slow and ineffective, and many people are still suffering. They don't have good jobs uh, and stuff like that. And the reconstruction plans, very few are implemented. Um, we, we also don't understand why it's taking such time. Of course, to some extent that the citizens were um, sort of discussing each other to reach some certain consensus. It takes time. But uh, according to the previous experiences 18 years ago of Kobe, it's still very problematic, and we may f face more problems. That's, this is a picture I took uh, about three weeks after the disaster in the city of Kesenuma. Um, and this ship, you can still find it on site as well as Google Earth. Uh, there's a talk to keep this as a kind of memorial site uh, following the Aceh's case. Um, so just to skip some of the, so this is, I, I had a f long time friend there, so I stayed at his house and this is a scene. Most of the houses you see uh, were not there. It's just the, the wave, the water blowed to. And uh, just only, this is sort of where, uh, the look where I stay, from where I stayed, 10 meters below is like that. Uh, so the natural question was, what can ICT or internet do for them of these disasters? And there are very little emergency preparedness, at least amongst the internet and ICT community, I must say. And there was what we call informational gap uh, between the sort of victims and the relief team. Uh, we don't know what's going on, and they couldn't say what they needed. And so to send all the material or, you know, even the water or personnel, at least in the very early days, for let's say three weeks or four, we faced a very severe information vacuum and gap. Um, so this is the a survey result. Uh, we conducted this in July last year, three months after, um, and asked by using the net uh, survey and also the field interview, and the pattern of the answer was very similar. Um, we asked what did, did they use frequently before the earthquake to the very left, and then a few hours after the earthquake, there the sharp drop is observed except the radio, which 67% people said they could use the radio, while the old others like TV, internet, mobile dropped 
almost half of less. And in one week, it's getting more recovery, uh, one month and three months. What's interesting was the fixed line uh, telephones in the green became uh, increased use exceeding the level before after three months. Um, we asked the, the free, question, free answers, what were the information sources they were not used for or not satisfied. The, the number one within a few hours was mobile, about a week again, and then one month, big satis dissatisfaction about the TV. This meant the sources or content of the TV were not providing accurate information, especially around the nuclear accident. Uh, that they started to realize the kind of information they provided within a week or two or three from the government or from even the experts were not really covering uh, the truth. Um, the email, uh, radio, also, in interestingly, radio were frequently used uh, right after and during the period of three months, but there's a lot of frustrations about radio as well, because local people really couldn't find the kind of information from the national news or even the prefectural capitals news didn't reach the coastal side. So these are another um, significant problems. And all, also, we did survey in the manner that we divided the locations on uh, three coastal prefectural areas and three inland areas. So essentially, with the six million population, uh, there are six areas we sort of demarcated and made the, some uh, cross-reference or cross-analysis. So um, this red line is the uh, symbolic, it's a one prefectural coast of Iwate, which was heavily hit by tsunami. So with the exception of radio and the word of mouth to the right, no other means showed any real effective use. Um, while in some other areas, TV were frequently used on, it was okay to use mobile voice, 40% said uh, in two areas, internet, yes. But if you are severely hit, of course, these are not uh, usable. The, maybe you may wonder why I'm showing this. It's so obvious. Because the problem is, in Tokyo and the metropolitan areas, things are very different. So what the majority of the people in Japan even had in mind was that internet, Twitter, SNS, mobile, were relatively okay and durable than the voice-based things. And this is largely true in the metropolitan area, but not really true in the devastated area or center of. So um, what are the reliable information sources by the citizens for the nuclear station accident, those who are residing close, like within 20 to 40 kilometers? Um, they say there was information on the accident, but for evacuation, very little, very confusing. I only heard the siren first, uh, get outside 10 kilometers away, and then got to, to you know, be directed to go to the certain other areas. Uh, this is not, well, my relative was working in the local government, so he told me at midnight about the story. <laughs> so these are the re re reliable sources. Um, and in a way, since IGF is based on the multi-stakeholder thing, when you s started to do the relief work, we worked together with the government and private sector. We didn't have much modality, and some private sector guy went to the totally ruined um, city office and helped set up the new website uh, with no qualification. There were certain interesting challenges happened. How can, well, we, we would go there and how can we help? And they may ask you back, who are you? Mm -hmm. And how do you really reconcile? Also, there are many uh, local uh, government people from outside the, uh, the devastated areas were sent to, but were they allowed to handle the personal data? Under certain rules, if you're not working for the city and got some sort of certificate, you're not allowed to touch, read these personal data. Of course, there were exceptions, um, but uh, largely they still face these kind of constraints. Um, I think I end my first presentation here and hand over to Toshi.
thank you. Uh, my name is Toshi Tateishi from uh, Japan Speed Association. Um, also, I run a small, small, very small ISP in my hometown, but uh, uh, fortunately, my hometown is uh, located in the West Japan. So, uh, my my company uh, has no damage, uh, but uh, after the earthquake occurred, um, probably uh, four hours later, uh, tsunami uh, alert uh, were coming in, but uh, there is no damage. <coughs> so, but. For unfortunately, I'm in Tokyo. So at that time, I'm in the middle of the Tokyo. So um, I'm almost leaving Japan. And 10 hours later, I'm planning to go to America. Uh, but I missed it. <coughs> so, uh, but unfortunately, we, uh, we don't have blackout. Uh, we have electricity uh, without uh, um, rate. Trains are not uh, available, but we can walk with uh, electric power and, uh, as you know, the, uh, uh, on the road. So uh, there is no panic in Tokyo. So uh, now, from now, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, recovery from the earthquake. So after the uh, two weeks or three weeks later, we have a meeting about this disaster. So. Uh, people say that many labs could save, uh, could be saved uh, if the information system is was active. So probably the, now we are talking about how to maintain or uh, activate the infrastructure for uh, 72 hours after the disaster. Now and uh, well, at least one hour to inform the people uh, what happened. Um, the uh, uh, most of the dead uh, no, no, do not know the did not know the uh, the information of tsunami, so they are uh, washed out by the uh, without uh, no information without information. So at that time, of course, the power was down, and uh, in Tokyo, uh, oh, I'm also uh, explain this. Let's skip this. So rec uh, recovery. So you know that many. Uh, backbone system is uh, broken or the power is down, so we can't, we couldn't use it. Uh, only power supplies uh, need, but uh, we can use the internet uh, IP phone around there. So satellite is very helpful. Uh, so, but uh, satellite is um, need a very uh, long lead time. So, almost one month. Uh, uh, many mobile stations were recovered by satellite and NTT and AU SoftBank in mobile in probably one week or two weeks. So the merit of it, uh, they can only uh, with uh, power they can learn, but take much to set and not blow up because uh, they <coughs> couldn't see the uh, videos. So we stand with Japan. I feel to, I said, as I mentioned, in my hometown is located in West Japan. So um, I have had a very uh, different uh, feeling. Uh, three days after uh, March 11th on TV, um, they just broadcast the uh, impression of movies only. So uh, we, almost the uh, West Japan people uh, didn't know the, what happened, really happened in Japan. Uh, East West Japan. Uh, so we could not get the information at the places around only tsunami. So uh, probably a 100 kilometer from tsunami area, um, many people uh, didn't have anything to eat. So uh, I'm sorry, this is not. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, this is the old one. So <coughs> at that time, so we think that we have to be prepared. So don't loot. This is a very uh, important, I think. But uh, you know the learning cost is a big problem. So we need some application or software uh, for everyone and every time uh, we can use and not only the usual time but also the emergency time. And we share the cost. This is a big problem, uh, how to share. And for example, web camera, uh, this is uh, really in uh, Coach Prefecture, it is uh, West Prefecture. West Japan and, and 
we have a uh, 10 web camera. So this is for in peace time, uh, for sightseeing and fishing and some surfing. So they use this uh, in, pre in peace time for the, uh, some uh, li like this purpose. But Iman uh, you know that we have uh, so many typhoon every year. So typhoon time, so the every local government officer goes to the uh, court side and take a picture and how it uh, every every while hour. So if they have a web camera, so they don't they not have to go to every hour. And uh, and we have to uh, remember the uh, woods eruption in 2000. Uh, this is Hokkaido. Uh, East uh, Japan, uh, I'm sorry, uh, North Japan. Um, uh, uh, 27th March uh, 2000 activated and uh, for just four days after uh, they erupted. But uh, almost uh, 10,000 people evacu uh, evacuated uh, such a s uh, short time. <coughs> and so fortunately they don't have uh, no casualty. Uh, there was long time relationship with some experts. So this is the reason why they can evacuate all of them. And uh, so, uh, without this relationship, I think that no no one uh, ran away. Uh, so, who believe that uh, such a strange uh, suggestion, strange suggestion? So, I think this is a good instance for the relationship, uh, mutual trust, and save the people, and. So the ICT is not only for the emergency time, but also the uh, usual time uh, help the, to make a relationship with citizens and experts. And now, <coughs> uh, Japan Cloud Working Group is one of the uh, cloud uh, association uh, will release a common API to use the cloud system in the emergency time, uh, which mentioned, uh, which uh, as I mentioned, uh, emergency time to build up uh, uh, local government sites. And uh, <coughs> Japan's weak point of the infrastructure of the internet is uh, uh, ex internet exchange point. Uh, most of the data traffic, probably more than 95% uh, must go to the Tokyo. So if some disaster occur in Tokyo, uh, probably the Japan's internet will not work. So <coughs> we should make a local uh, exchange point for the emergency case. Uh, so now we challenge to a uh, uh, local access point in Okinawa, which is located in southwest uh, mainland from uh, uh, mainland of Japan, uh, 1,000 kilometer from Tokyo. So this is a big challenge, but we have to do it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tatei. If you have any burning questions about <laughs> what happened to uh, in Japan to Tatesan and myself, you are welcome to raise now. Otherwise, we'll move to the next pre short presentation without, uh, with, you, you want to show the video now? I think later might, but. Okay, then balance, floor is yours. Okay, uh, good afternoon. I want to present some experience from Indonesia about how we, the civil society and also the industry helping hand in hand in the disaster area. And my first experience in the disaster area is uh, on 2004, 2005 when Aceh area West part of Indonesia hit by tsunami, and uh, I got chance to fly to the disaster area five days after the tsunami, where when I still can see a dead body anywhere and in the really terrible condition. But I I flew there with the uh, Australia Air Force. They give us space to fly there with uh, five other people and six of us are were uh, engineer IT engineer and we went there to help uh, the disaster relief with the our IT skills not uh, like regular other people maybe they go there for helping 
for the Red Cross or for some other uh, body. And uh, I'm agree that uh, one of the hard problem we will found on disaster area is the electricity. Yeah. And uh, we found this problem also in Aceh. And uh, but the the government electricity company managed to make the electricity up one week after the disaster. But of course, it's only in a very small area, very selected area. For example, the hospital, the government building, and also in some of the refugee camp. And uh, we built network on the disaster area in Aceh and one month after the disaster we have like uh, 15 uh, hotspot area where journalists uh, and also uh, humanitarian staffs can use it for helping their programs and later on uh, we got a donation from Intel Corporation. We got a full package of uh, WiMAX network. We got a three base station and also other 50 uh, WiMAX station. And we use this, all of this uh, equipment as a city infrastructure. And we connect to the ISP, we connect to some other uh, network like university and other things and they have a quite good uh, city backbone with the uh, WMAX uh, technology uh, and remember this is on 2005 where the WMAX technology is very in the uh, early stage of the technology and we create also a website and some other uh, technical things like a short code SMS uh, four digit of short code SMS where people can send a text and it will show on the website they can ask a question or they can inform something like uh, I'm looking for these people or some other things we create also a early warning system application which uh, with uh, connecting several TV station with the meteorology data so when we got an uh, earthquake somewhere in Indonesia and the meteorology thinks that it will got a tsunami warning, the information goes directly to the TV station, so TV station can uh, make a warning to the people. And uh, our programs not stop in Aceh, we still do our support for the disaster relief program across the country. We have several other program on other area like NIAS on 2005, Wasior, Padang, Bengkulu, Jogja for the earthquake and volcano, Pangandaran for the small tsunami, Mentawai, Bojonegoro, and other area. Quite a lot uh, disaster we got uh, in the last, sef last uh, seven years. And uh, I want to share experience also from 2010 from the volcano we have a volcano eruption the volcano called uh, Merapi mountain it's uh, located 30 kilometers from Yogyakarta city and uh, it's a really uh, live and active volcano and uh, the city is uh, have 30 three million of populations quite uh, many people live there because it's uh, a lot of uh, students from from the university and uh, on the first eruption almost 50,000 of people evacuated it's in the 10 kilometers of radius from the volcano and uh, there were there was a second eruption on November 4th 2004 at 1 a.m. the government extend the evacuation area to 20 kilometers radius from the volcano. And all refugees that already settled on the refugee camp has moved down 
and of course we got more and more refugee and the total refugee is about 100,000 people so it just in uh, several hours the refugee number changed from 50,000 to 100,000 people because the government extend the evacuation area and what makes a problem is all the equipment for preparing the food for the refugee is still on the old base camp the old uh, refugee camp so it's quite difficult to manage uh, to prepare food for 100,000 people in the next day because all the equipment it's uh, on the old refugee camp and I think this is uh, where we really found a really nice example where the civil society and the people help hand in hand together uh, it started on the Twitter started on the Facebook and also one communic one other communication quite familiar in Indonesia is a uh, Blackberry messenger and people start tweeting about uh, how this refugee can get food in the morning and etc and it raised the uh, people to give small food for the refugee for example one home maybe can uh, donate like 20 box of food or some other things and on the next day they manage to get uh, food for all the refugee and I think this is a really good example how uh, social media can uh, help uh, us on the disaster and also the ISP Association make a program that we create a temporary uh, FM radio so we can give information to the people in the disaster area in the refugee camp the government the DGPT give us a temporary allocation of uh, FM radio it's a uh, 100.2 FM 100.2 megahertz in the FM radio and a uh, national radio of Indonesia also borrowed us uh, their equipment to uh, make the radio station we also got help from the volunteer where we got like I think almost 30 people do volunteering for the announcer uh, scriptwriter uh, reporter and some other things this radio up for 30 days in the and 30 days uh, 24 hours a day so it's quite good program I think I think that's uh, my short presentation Izumi thank you thank you Valens um, he has ample experience in the best practices so 10 minutes is quite unfair to you <laughs> but I'm <laughs> no, sorry no. Um, so <laughs> now so these are the what happened in Asia but the disaster doesn't have any border like the internet, so correct? Thank you, Sumi. It's um, it's very hard to match the experiences in Asia, uh, and I feel a little bit humbled by talking about our experiences listening to the, the, the previous speakers. Um, but there were some experiences we made in Sweden, um, and, and some I was going to talk a little bit about what that learned us to, to how we organized after this and what, what happened. Um, so Sweden had, since before, um, always had a, some sort of resiliency and critical infrastructure protection in place for disasters, uh, wars, whatever you want. Um, so following up the example from Japan, for example, uh, the exchange points that we run are actually distributed throughout the country. Since we started in 1997, the exchange points are in five different cities all around the country, and they are in secure underground bunkers in facilities to protect against uh, natural disasters or, or or other uh, events, uh, and this was deliberately done from the beginning, and they are very re re uh, robust infrastructure. And um, but I'll come back to that. Um, <coughs> this was somewhat tested in in uh, in January 2005 when what was named by the Swedish Weather Service as the Hurricane um, Gudrun, which is a Swedish name, uh, or Irvin by the German Weather Service. Um, hurricanes are very unusual in Scandinavia. I think, as a matter of fact, 1902 was the last time. Um, and this was a storm that moved from the west across all of the, the Scandinavia and all of northern Europe. Um, and um, in when this hit the um, 
uh, the west coast of Sweden that was the most badly affected. I actually happened to be driving through these storms. I, I, I saw it firsthand during the night. And um, it hit landfall around 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And um, on the west coast of Sweden, we have two of the main uh, nuclear power plants that supply a lot of the Swedish energy. And although there wasn't actually a tsunami as we had in Japan, what actually happened was that the water contained a lot of salt. And this drew, drew up a lot of clouds of salt that um, affected the power lines. And, and the storm also took out all the power lines. And a nuclear power plant, when you don't have enough demand, you have to shut them down. And they were also getting scared that the salt would be increasing the risk for, uh, for short circuits inside the nuclear power plants because there's so much salt in there. So they had to shut them down. Uh, and that took out power, the, the basically the power supply in the western part of, uh, sorry, the southern part of Sweden and southwest. Um, and in addition, a lot of the power lines were destroyed because both power and telecommunication lines were uh, is actually ca mostly ca at that time mostly cable borne, so on, on on poles rather than dig into the ground. And um, and during the night, uh, 340,000 households were out, uh, were without power. Uh, the, the, the major cities were doing a little bit better than, than the rest of the countryside was. Um, funny enough, and I was saying this before, um, we actually didn't notice anything because our underground bankers, of course, running around happily and we had diesel generators and power. Of course, there was no end users to send any traffic over this nice infrastructure, though, because they had lost power since long ago. Um, we did see, though, there was an immense surge of traffic in the rest of the country to try to access information. And this is why she, one of the important lessons is that people's behavior has changed when it comes to accessing information. And you were both the earlier pres or the three earlier presenters talked about this about a bit that we are seeing um, the people's behaviors for how to access information today is that you will go online and you click reload on a new site just to see if there's any new information. You keep clicking, clicking reload. Uh, when I was a kid. Um, we used to get this training in school that you know if there was a nuclear war, we should go inside closed doors, windows, and turn on the radio. Today, people go inside closed doors, windows, and click reload. And and I think it's important that when we talk about this disaster communication, that we realize this. And um, but the 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 outcome anyway was very much that what we learned was that we lost the cell phone networks in a large part of this, and we lost the 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 uh, because of lack of power, and we lost uh, a lot of the cables. Um, and it came down very much to being very physical damage. And the, the hard part was, how do you repair these physical cables? And Sweden is not such a large, large country. We're only 9 million people. And um, one of the, the biggest problems was that there wasn't enough people that were, that were trained to actually repair the high voltage power lines or the phone lines. And we're trying to fly people in from the rest of Sweden as soon as they could in the early morning hours of January the 9th when they could fly again. Um, the problem they had was actually to get there. Uh, the roads I was driving up, the roads were literally covered in forest. Uh, trees had been carried over 60 meters by the winds. And um, uh, the, the damage on, the, on, the, on just the southern part of Sweden in one province was equal to the entire forest uh, 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 consumption for a year in all the country. So it's an enormous amount of forest that had fallen over the roads. And the, the, these repair teams couldn't get out until the rescue services managed to clear the roads. And it was a major logistical exercise. Uh, not even the, the army could actually be of much help because the trees were so immense to, to come through. And, and it became very physical. How do you fix this? And, and um, they flew in um, help teams from Germany who offered to assist. The problem was the Germans had no training on how the Swedish power grid was working or the telephone network. So they were actually pretty useless in the end. Uh, and it was, it was nice of them to help, but uh, uh, it wasn't actually, it would have very limited effect on the, the speed, the recovery time. And this in total led to some thinking afterwards and how do we plan this better? So there was a few things that people identified that could have been done better. One would have been to actually share resources because it turned out that most of the cell phone towers, for example, from the various operators, are one, they are fairly close to each other. Two, uh, we, all, we don't need all of them working. We need to extend to enable roaming between the operators and just make sure that they, they agree on who fixes which cell phone tower and go out with, with portable diesel generators and, and to recover the tower. And um, it actually turned out, this, this is a very interesting, we have simulated this afterwards, and, and there was this idea that this should be coordinated centrally, we should have some sort of crisis group to de de decide this. But the problem is that if you sit in a crisis group in Stockholm and you're dealing with a situation on the ground in Western Sweden, I have no idea which road is accessible and which is not. And we realized that the best way to do would actually to give the local teams power to decide and actually allow them to, between them, decide who fixes what cell phone towers. Um, and also repair the power and so on. Um, 
this led to the revival of a group that had existed in the past, uh, which is a crisis group that exists uh, with representatives from us and all the telcos, the, the military, um, the power company, etc. And this group can be activated 24 by 7 uh, by any one of us can actually request this group to be called together in case we believe that there's a situation threatening the communication networks uh, and that we could actually need help from anyone. And we can all, all so it's not just the government, any operator can activate this group. Um, in addition to this, we also started doing trainings. So in 2009, we had the first major exercise where all the carriers and, and we, the exchange point, and, and a few others were involved in simulating a, a terrorist attack. And this went on for 36 hours. Uh, and it was a very well-run exercise, actually, very realistic. Um, and we had various communications fi failures throughout the country. And, and we had to deal with it. And, and uh, the team who was actually doing the playback against us was doing a very, very well simulation job. Um, this was a huge success, and in 2011, this was repeated again, and this time we were simulating a breakage of a water dam in, dam in northern Sweden. Um, this dam exists for real. Uh, this, the, the only little <laughs> bit of a problem with the exercise turned out to be that the simulation was that the dam broke, and actually downstream of this dam is every single power line and phone line from north to south in Sweden, and, and a lot of roads, and it was all cut. What people hadn't thought about was that on each side of the, the the river that would cause by dam cut, there's actually an uh, army, army engineering course and also very big supply uh, depots for the telecom equipment. And it turned out, although the exercise was supposed to last for 36 hours, the problems were actually fixed within a few hours because it was so easy to get stuff in there and fix it, which sort of a little bit took away the purpose of the exercise. But um, uh, in that exercise, again, it was identified that it's very hard centrally to decide what is an accessible road and what is not. And what can be done on the ground is easier to decide by the local people. And then, of course, the, the team li running the exercise made sure more things happen so we could get on for the full 36 hours. But um, again, this exercise is very good for, for training communication between all the groups and also sharing experiences and learning between this. And, um, and also seeing what 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 can a carry what help can the carriers get from the government and so on. And we we run a lot of this exercise, and there's another one planned for next year. So we keep doing this every second year, and they're quite big exercises. Uh, and they have the first one we did was done. Everybody were in their own office or in the knock, and we actually run this as a as a as a stand a, as a real life exercise. The second one we all were sitting in a in a conference big conference center, a secure conference center by the government, um, and 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 running through this. Um, so two different approaches to the exercise as well, uh, to how to do this. But they were this, I think it's very, very good to run this exercise and build on this experience. And that's why I think it's very interesting to learn about other people's experiences as well. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks, Kurt. Um, we'll come back to the exercise perhaps later. Um, before moving to Ben, I'm sorry, I have to apologize that I had to introduce our remote moderator, Sylvia Candena, um, now working in Australia for APNIC, um, and she, as I mentioned, she also came and study and the, the some time later, if you don't have any remote <laughs> voices or on top of that, please. Um, now I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Robert Ben. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna come at the topic from a slightly different perspective, which is, not a story about a disaster, but rather a story about how to create the tools that can be used in, in a disaster scenario. And uh, I've been a part of a group on and off for about 10 years that began with the following problem. What do you do when you don't have the internet and you need it? Simple proposition. And we came up with the idea that we needed to have both internet access capabilities as well as intranet communications capabilities. So a small group of people in a local area <coughs> could communicate internally to one another as well as out to the internet. And we wanted to have three different use cases. Use case number one, there's no network because there's been a natural disaster and the existing infrastructure has been destroyed or disabled. Use case number two, oh, and, and the secondary uh, part of that use case is uh, there's no network because you're in such a rural area that it's simply impossible to get connectivity into that area. Use case number two, you are a political dissident in a country where it is dangerous for you to use the internet. 
and to uh, risk using a telecommunication service that is heavily surveilled by security services. And you need some off-network solution in order to communicate amongst your peer group or out to the rest of the world. And use case number three is there are network services available, but you cannot afford them. It's too expensive. And so you need a lower cost communication service that is built by the community for the community. And th this technology was developed about 10 years ago by some graduate students who were primarily sitting in use case number three. We had no money and we wanted to have internet access. <laughs> and we came up with the idea that if we all lived in the same neighborhood, if one of us could buy a DSL connection and we could put antennas on top of our houses and share that connectivity on the rooftop antennas, then we could essentially get internet access for one-tenth of the price. Ten, ten houses sharing one connection. And so some clever computer engineers developed a, a protocol for an open source ad hoc wireless mesh network. Would essentially allow one connection to pass packets between all of the antennas on the system and be able to communicate between the antennas as well as down into a local area network with essentially a small Wi-Fi cloud. We used Wi-Fi frequencies exclusively. That system worked okay, but it was buggy and it took many years to develop the code and to refine it. But so fast forward to today, this project uh, is now known as the Commotion Wireless Project. Commotion Wireless Project has received several million dollars of support from the U.S. State Department to advance the cause of internet freedom around the world, to help uh, dissidents to uh, have secure communications off of the incumbent telecommunications network, or in the case of a country or a city or a neighborhood where the internet has been shut down, to have the capability to create your own network communications, either intranet or internet access, in a local area. And the test bed for the Commotion Wireless Network is actually being built in inner city Detroit, which is one of the lowest income communities in the United States, where the problem is not that there isn't internet access or a network available, it's that people cannot afford it. And we have begun to think about deploying uh, the Commotion ad hoc wireless solution in, in disaster areas as well. So here's how it works. It's a pretty simple idea. We call it software as infrastructure. The idea behind commotion is that we cannot assume that anybody has any specialized gear. So we're going to have to use equipment that is available on site in any given circumstance. So the way commotion works, if we wanted to set up commotion network here in this room, what would happen is each of us would take out a laptop or a phone and download the commotion software and hit go. Literally, there's a button that says go. <laughs> and commotion's... There is there, an Android version is in development. So essentially, the network the software would uh, begin to communicate peer to peer with all of the devices that it could see in the room. And it would form a network, a highly redundant, resilient network that would have multiple paths of communicating across the network. And if any of us had an internet connection, it would also share that internet connection across the system. Layered on top of the commotion network, uh, uh, transport is also. Uh, encryption. So every single communication that's transmitted from phone to phone or phone to laptop or laptop to internet is all uh, through encrypted tunnels. Uh, it's been a, a very uh, exciting development process. Uh, the, the beta version of Commotion I think is going to be released in the early part of next year. We'll begin doing deployments and expanding the test bed outside of Detroit. But we are, are really optimistic that Commotion can be a, a very effective solution for disaster relief. <coughs> and and I've, I've studied some of the most successful disaster relief communications efforts, and they all uh, follow a similar model. And I, I've, I've looked at uh, what, what happened in Indonesia, which is one of the most innovative uh, and, and interesting examples in, in such a critical area. Also, there's a good example after the earthquake in Chile a couple of years ago. They did an excellent job of getting connectivity down into coastal areas that were impacted by the earthquake. But essentially, it's a straightforward solution. You find an internet connection somewhere that's still live, and you take a point-to-point -point link 
as with as much capacity as it will carry, and you beam that connectivity as close to the disaster site as you can, and then you share that connectivity out in some way, either through a series of hotspots, or in the case of commotion, we, we would imagine sharing it out through an ad hoc uh, mesh network where any new device that anybody on the ground had could simply download the software and join the network instantly. Whether they are German disaster relief workers who have come and don't have connectivity uh, and don't know what's going on but need to know what's going on, or they're a victim of the tsunami who need to get information about where to evacuate, or they're a potential uh, relief organization who needs to know where to deliver food aid, all of these institutions can get access to the same network uh, using the MeSH protocol. So that's the idea behind commotion. Uh, it's something that we uh, have intentionally uh, developed as an open source product so that everybody in the community uh, of which the IGF is a central part can get a hold of it and tinker with it and make it better and refine it and deploy it and find ways to use this mesh protocol to solve all kinds of different problems uh, with disaster relief being at the top of the list as one of our, our most uh, urgent use cases. So I'll stop there uh, because I'm interested in, in continuing the discussion and, and listening to people's questions. Thank you, Ben. Um, so for the next 35 or more minutes, um, we'll go more discussion. Uh, with the moderator's uh, privilege, I would like to give some short punch to <laughs> balance to begin with, but uh, you're welcome to jump in. Yes, Sylvia. We don't have um, remote participant uh, questions. Yeah, you can poke them. Yes. Okay, one from each, <laughs> something like that. And we'll give you some nice brochure <laughs> remotely. Um, Balance, you came to Japan uh, last year uh, about this time and went together with me to the tsunami destroyed areas. Did you find any lesson you could have passed to them or the other way around that you took out of your visit or you find something very much in common or something very different? Okay, uh, one thing I learned a lot from Japan is that uh, they prepare the people and also the government very well. I think uh, even if we see that uh, the government is slow or the government is not very good in terms of uh, doing the disaster relief, I think, but it will be still very different if the government or the people in Japan not prepared it uh, before. Like, uh, yes, uh, we, we, we can make a uh, early warning system, but sometimes uh, the system not work because some other disaster happened before the major disaster. I think that's what happened in Japan, right? Yeah, the, the earthquake cut the fiber and then the tsunami came later and the disaster uh, early warning system not work very well. Yeah, but it's still that uh, people need to prepare and uh, people need to do exercise how they face the earthquake or other disaster. Unless uh, it will be, a unless uh, we will face a very miscoordination with the government and the people and uh, uh, civil society and 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 the social media that a lot of people use right now will be not a help tool but or but will be a makes the condition worse because people just scream people just say it the bad things asking a bad question and no one can uh, do the coordination the coordination must happen before the disaster it's very difficult to make a coordination after this after disaster if you are if, if we are not prepared i think that's uh, i learned from japan thank you thank you tatoshi san <coughs> he said we have good preparation <laughs> exercise stuff does it match with your experience and observation <laughs> uh, i'm sorry I, I i i didn't think so so because uh, <laughs> after that we we uh, uh, with some um, minister office, uh, we are uh, thinking to make a um, temporary WiMAX system al uh, along the coast, which is suffered by uh, tsunami. But uh, uh, it, uh, we, we, we couldn't do it. So <coughs> uh, 
uh, as I mentioned in the Mount Lucy um, eruption, so we should do as as you sa as you said that uh, we have to much more um, dialogue or uh, usual dialogue or relationship, uh, not only for the disaster, um, we 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 have to do it. So, and um, as Aizu-san said, we we don't have a <laughs> um, much uh, preparation for the disaster. I think still we don't have. If I may, one clarification perhaps is the whole preparedness for the whole disaster and the preparation for the ICT or communication network sector could be a different thing. Um, many schools in the devastated areas had did a lot of training to the pupils that two cities at least reported no casualty of the students under the school's administration. Kamaishi is one, and another is called Kesenuma, which I visited both. And one of the cities did, uh, over the course of 15 months, 300 times of exercise, or local um, exercises in each school. And even like twice or three times in the same place. First, you have to draw with the, the parental citizens. Okay, you have to make your own evacuation plan on how do you escape from the, the tsunami and you have to draw, you have to discuss as a workshop. Next week, okay, you exercise, you implement, you just, okay, tsunami came here, so you go. And then they were monitored by the experts in the city that, okay, the way you handled was not correct. You better fix this way, do it again. With the repetition of these works, w where it was done, and really it saved the people. It's not the ICT that saved, but this exercise whilst one of a few schools that had a more tragedy that they didn't, they were not prepared and they, those teachers couldn't say anything so that the pupil of 100 just stayed and stayed inside the, well, outside the school. And then only f one minute before the tsunami came, they started to evacuate and most of the lives lost. Uh, it didn't go to the court yet, but y nobody knows. Um, anyway, so, the communication or ICT sector's preparedness might be different from, and what Kurt s said was interesting, um, this uh, combination of forest <laughs> problem. Was it anticipated somehow? Uh, what do you do next? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, th this was an extreme weather phenomenon for, for all of Scandinavia. I mean, we, we never had this, and I don't think that anyone was prepared for, for the extent of the damages and the amount of tree lines. I mean, we have, one example I heard about the 60 meter was that the, the, the main power lines in Sweden have tree clearings which are 60 meters on each side. Uh, some of these power lines were taken down by fallen trees. There were trees over there. So these trees were lifted by the wind 60 meters before they hit the power lines. And and no one can, uh, can, can guess that. And, and the, the amount of work they needed to actually clear the trees just to get to the power lines and, and restore them was enormous. And, and um, what we have started doing, but is at an enormous cost, that I should dig all this down, to so put it into the ground and not have it vulnerable for this. But it, it, it's, um, it, it's a very expensive process and, and, uh, and also time consuming. It takes a long time. But that is what, what we are, that is work doing in Sweden to this, both for telecom and for, for power lines. So it, but I mean, one thing, just to, sorry, one last thing, what, what was learned in both then and the exercises afterwards is that uh, something that really did help, that the government could help the operators with, was to actually get the army out. Because the army has much more stronger utility vehicles than any of the other ones has. And the army, <laughs> we, we, in what it exercised we joke was that we're really sorry, but the best thing you can do is take us from one place to A to place B. And, and the army was a little bit, you know, well, they, they thought they had a bigger role. But it actually turned out that, that that's something that they did really well, because they can do this even in, in and they've done this afterwards in big snow, con in bad snow conditions in the north and so on. And, um, and, and that's how things we learn about. Um, ben, first, I, I had a question. Why did you start that preparation or use of ad hoc in the first place? You didn't tell that. What's the genesis of your project? <laughs> the idea was to build community networks that were built and operated by the community. And so there would be no one central operator. There would be no, it was to break the hub and spoke model <coughs> where there's a central office or <coughs> there's a tower or there's a cable head end. The idea was it doesn't matter 
where the network begins. You can you can have 10 people with rooftop antennas in a single DSL line, or you can have a thousand people with 25 different broadband connections of different types, and you can have different types of antennas. And if one person moves away and takes their antenna down, or the cat knocks the antenna off the roof, it doesn't matter because the network will just simply route around them and note that right. it's gone. If I may, is that a US-based project in the beginning? It was in the beginning. Now there are deployments all over the world, including uh, in um, Austria and in Greece in, yeah. and in uh, West Africa and Ghana. Interesting, because in 1998 or so, I, I w there was INET in Switzerland or Geneva, and I was approached by the guy from the Lausanne Institute of Technology, had a very similar idea called Telenode. And this came out of Kosovo, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, during this, this bombing of Kosovo's civil war days, those um, people uh, who are not with the then the status quo had difficulty in using telephone because it's wiretapped. And they couldn't use satellite TV, they didn't al the government didn't allow. So essentially there was no communication for them to get any news from outside or to get out from them that they came the similar idea of a ad hoc or mesh network which doesn't rely on the operators, state-based or whatever. I don't know if that's materialized or not, but it sounds like a very similar thing. The other thing you can do is you can, uh, you can essentially create your own community media platform by adding a server to your network and putting content on it. So, for example, in, in a disaster scenario, if you want to run an internet-based radio station that is only broadcasting to people on the local area network who connect through the software, it's no problem to do that. You just throw it up on your own server. You're hosting it yourself. It's on the, no the local network. You're not even dependent on a reliable internet connection because you're only sending that, ca that capability inside your internal network. Floor is open. If you ha yes, uh, I'll take a few comments and questions and, and, and then shoot the panels. Hi, um, my name is Eileen Guo, and I run a, a social media mobile tech consultancy based in Afghanistan. Um, and I, obviously, because of the theme of this panel, you guys have been talking a lot about internet uh, in, in post-disaster, and I'm interested in your thoughts on, on um, the different types of information and the different utilities of using mobile tech and, you know, like crowd mapping, um, SMS-based services that you started to talk about a little bit versus internet and, and what um, how the responses would differ and how they could be used differently. Thank you. Uh, we'll keep it. And you have some question comment? Um, is there any wireless microphone? Yes, please, give him. Can you hear me now? Thank you. I have... Uh, I have three questions. Uh, oh yes, I'm sorry. My name is Harold Lee. I am I am from Norway. I run a small consulting company. Um, I have two questions for Ben, and then I guess one question for the for the panel. Um, first question for Ben: Is there any reason why you could not run voice over IP over Promotion? Second question for Ben: um, Promotion seems to be a great tool for first responders as well, such as fire, ambulance. Can you think of any reasons why it shouldn't be that way? And then my third question, I guess, is maybe a little bit more general, is that, you know, traditional emergency networks uh, such as TEFRA cover uh, many countries. They are, they have low capacity, which means that you cannot send pictures and things like that over them. Uh, you need a special terminal to use it and they are not very flexible networks. Um, can you think of any ways to make these emergency networks uh, work with or be enhanced by you know, the IP networks that, that you have discussed? Thank you. Any one more? Sylvia, please. Well, I, I, w I want to make some comments, um, not questions, or maybe it's better if you, you answer the 
the questions and then I make a comment? Okay. Peter. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I was just um, uh, going to to comment on um, some of the, the responses that um, uh, Isumi gave to Ben about other experiences doing similar uh, or addressing similar uh, situations through different responses. And I think that is all part of how we all solve problems in different contexts. And is there is a lot of initiatives on software, networks, mesh networks, uh, mobile SMS services, ad addressing emergency communications um, with different purposes, right? And uh, I think that uh, I'm, I'm uh, really concerned that only when something of the magnitude of the tsunami in Japan, a room will be full of people discussing the issues. And now that there is, there are no disasters around, the room is empty. So it's or almost <laughs> sorry. So yeah, I'm I'm really concerned that the innovation that many people are, are have suffered disasters like this, uh, and their commitment and their passion to bring things uh, available for others, good, bad, wrong, expensive, uh, too much electricity, whatever the uh, solutions they made, is not getting the relevance. Uh, or getting the attention of all of us that could be in a disaster zone at any time, and it, it, it I think is is a it is uh, is a big concern to me. After what I saw in Japan during my visit, is is how vulnerable we are all, we all are. So, um, if there's no other comment or questions, well. Hannah is free to also quest each other, <laughs> but um, let's let's begin with your question from Afghanistan on any different types of information using mobile or uh, cloud mapping stuff like that. But how do we really respond to that kind of situation? Am I right, or do you get? Yeah. Ben? I can offer <coughs> one example um, where. Basic application SMS applications were used effectively after the uh, the earthquake in Haiti. Um, lots of good uh, work that was done there, essentially mapping where the relief services were, uh, getting to people who were continued to be trapped. A lot of people sent SMS messages and s said, "I'm here and I can't get out. Please come and rescue me." Uh, and then later, uh, basic SMS applications were used to direct traffic, to say, for local officials to say, don't come down this road, there's a giant house collapsed in the middle of it, you can't drive a truck over this bridge, it's not there anymore. Uh, the SMS mapping capabilities using you know, basic Ushahidi platforms uh, were quite successful, not just in the immediate aftermath of the Haiti earthquake, but for months afterwards, those continued to be used. If I could clarify my question, I was actually involved in the, the Yushikiri response um, based in the States. Uh, so what I was really trying to ask, I think, is why the focus on internet as opposed to mobile in post-disaster, other than the obvious um, panel theme? From my perspective, if you have internet, you have mobile too. You can, any, if you have an internet connection, you can do everything on the internet with an IP connection that you can do with SMS. Uh, also, you, typically for the SMS infrastructure, you need towers that are operational and uh, a traditional telecom infrastructure, which is not always feasible. But I, I agree that in a lot of cases, particularly when the user base is more comfortable with SMS, more uh, used to using SMS, that it can be a more important tool in, for expanding the number of people who are accessing the technology. I just want to add one thing about this SMS versus email. I do think there's a little bit, when one, one use case is a little bit different was that after the tsunami in the, in the uh, we heard about it, uh, that when it also hit Thailand, uh, a lot of Scandinavians and Swedish, as I know, but was also affected and killed in this. And one use case that the Swedish foreign ministry found was that they, if they would then, now they do, um, they didn't then, have the ability to actually 
push communication out to citizens because you know email access means that the people who are stranded there or still alive need to go find IP and then have to figure out where to go. But the foreign ministry identified was that if they would have had the ability to send messages to all Swedish cell phones currently roaming in Thailand, that would have been extremely useful for them to push information out of what to do and how to get in contact with, with the embassy. So I think there is a little bit of different use case. I agree with you. You probably have coverage, but the use cases are different. Yeah, if I can add uh, some comment or answer. Uh, each technology have their own specific things, like the what you need to run the technology and uh, some other things. But uh, IP network, I think, is the easiest uh, technology we can deploy right now. Uh, you just need a satellite disk and uh, Wi-Fi access point. I think the this it's it's the smallest IP network we can deploy with very fast. But uh, of course, uh, doing a disaster recovery, you have to find which technology is available on that area. That's I think the that's the most. Uh, question we have to answer first when we came to the area of the disaster and uh, sometimes it's uh, the operator telco is still available sometimes not or also the electricity and also uh, the characteristic of its technology is quite different like for the text messaging the text is uh, we can send the information really fast to a lot of people but it needs a telco network. But with email, it's uh, not very fast, but uh, with a very small TCP IP network, it can work. And I did to make a FM radio station. Why? Because the people in the refugee don't have any computer or some other things. And the easiest way is we give away like 10,000 of a radio uh, portable to the refugees so they can listen to any announcement or any uh, other information very quick from the government i think it's uh i i make uh, five things with that we we need on the disaster like preparation of course and immediate response but the third thing is the how we can utilize local resources yeah i think that's uh to do that uh, we need a uh, I think uh, IT knowledge, IT skills, so you know quite a lot of technology. You don't only depend on one te technology, you can have to use uh, several different technology. And also uh, collaboration, I think it's um, very important also, government, NGO, uh, people. Yeah, thank you. Can we move to the next question? Two questions to Ben and the third one for all. So, uh, quick responses. Yes, VoIP uh, runs on the commotion platform, no problem. Um, it, it has occasionally are latency problems, depending on how many hops away you are from where you want to go. <laughs> and the power levels of the transmitter that's carrying the signal to you. Uh, we're currently working on some methodologies to reduce packet loss so that real-time voice communications will run even when you have high latency circumstances. Um, first responders, uh, we've had a lot of interest in this technology from first responders, so I see no reason why it shouldn't be valuable for first responders. There was a, we were at a, I was at a conference a couple of months ago in Boston. Uh, it was hosted by Harvard and MIT and, and in invited all of the emergency response community from Boston to join us, and it was really quite interesting. They were saying, and this speaks to your third question, that they wanted to get rid of all of their legacy equipment because it didn't work properly and it was extraordinarily expensive because there are very few customers buying these specialized boxes and specialized uh, handsets to communicate on special frequencies. You know, five thousand dollars for one phone and twenty thousand dollars for a base station that were now dated and the technology was 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 worse than a cell phone people they were literally not using their 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 expensive specialized first responder equipment they're using their cell phones is just m better but if the cell towers went down then nobody had any practice using this the legacy equipment 
So they said, look, what, what we really want to do is be able to roll a truck to the site, roll a series of trucks to the site of the disaster, throw an antenna on the top of the highest point, and have every one of our uh, first responders with whatever device they happen to have in their pocket with the software preloaded on it. So no matter where they are, no matter what's happening, no matter the circumstances, they're all connected by this local area network. And they have generators already in the truck. So I think it's, it's actually an ideal solution for the hours after a disaster when there has to be communications immediately, particularly amongst the first responder units that are coming into the disaster area. Yep, Sylvia. Well, I, I would like to share some um, uh, insights from some of the projects that we have been um, able to support from the ECF Asia uh, program. And uh, one project in particular that we have uh, uh, get information about uh, in Japan, the one with the helium balloons, that maybe you can share some information. Um, um, we have supported the Dumbo project in Thailand that is also doing a um, mesh network that heal, heals itself and basically put the routers on top of the elephants and they move the network where, where they need it. So they took the elephants and if the trucks can make it, the elephants will take it. So they, um, we supported the, all the training materials and the development of um, uh, workshops and to transfer the technology and they have been able to uh, work really closely with people in Indonesia, in Myanmar, in other, in, uh, also in other uh, uh, parts of the region. And it's a similar um, life uh, cycle in terms of age, you know, how, how all these projects are. It's very similar to the, how, how the, the network of that Ben described, or the solutions that Ben described uh, started. Um, also, the, um, there is another Another project um, from Synapse Health in the Philippines that it, they did, um, they asked us to for some funds to develop one module that they were missing on this SMS uh, solution that was only to, uh, for the health, health uh, providers in the area to identify how many blankets they have to move from one place to the other, how many vaccines, how many water bottles, how, how many. So they trucks will be loaded in the right amounts and they will not, you know, do eternal rounds of things and, and ended up without distributing the, the help needed at the right place at the right time. The good thing about this um, initiative was that it was uh, taken over by the government and included in the National Emergency Plan in the Philippines and now is part of um, the Tsunami Alert Center uh, for the Pacific. Then there is another m initiative from the Bacha University in uh, Vietnam, and they develop um, um, a, G a GPS wireless ad hoc sensor network that is supposed to help um, people, um, the fisher folk in, uh, at sea, uh, to communicate, not, to the, not necessarily during a disaster, but they can monitor the weather and, and um, how many boats are coming and uh, communicate with, with the pier to bring the fish in and stuff. But then if they are in an emergency situation, they can be rescued by this, uh, with this type of, of uh, network, which is also a very interesting um, uh, project. And then there is another project in, uh, sorry? Yeah, there, there, are, there, there are, I mean, what I'm trying to say is that there are a lot of solutions out there or initiatives that are uh, pushing the boundaries of innovation. And it, it is um, really important that we try our best to put them together and to see what uh, the exchange of information and flow can provide. Thank you. Uh, going to your comment earlier you made about how easy people forget or didn't, you know, go. Tatei san, you mentioned in the early stage that those hit by tsunami to the east side of Japan, uh, people are more really. Um, strong interest still. Well, may not be the case for some, but those who are far away in the West, like your hometown and so forth and so forth, do they really care or how do you really mobilize the people, authorities, such, um, if you can share any comment, observation? Mm. So, um, the TV set uh, um, make a loud uh, noise for about uh, uh, such a big disaster. Uh, people have a 
uh, some mm, uh, interest and uh, they, they think uh, they have to do something for the uh, people who suffered from tsunami or earthquake. But uh, after probably seven days or 10 days, and uh, the TV set uh, will never s uh, talk about that. So uh, they are getting, mm, their, their memory is decreasing every every hour, I think. So <coughs> as the uh, East Coast, uh, Japan, and like as I said, as I mentioned, the, the elementary school children um, have a, a training for almost every day. So we should do something for their uh, to memorize or remember the uh, disasters. I, I don't know how about that, I think. Thank you. Yes, together we were planning this 72 hours training in three weeks time from now. Suppose your communication line and also the power line and also the traffic all shut down and we are going to local government office and uh, we are working together with the local government uh, especially in the focus is the handling of the information, uh, collection of the information, uh, analyzing and disseminate or share. When you have no communication infrastructure, we are talking about the use of the paper, seriously. Uh, maybe these can be used to take pictures with the GPS um, data. Even if the network is not there, if there's an ad hoc solution, then you can bring this run to the <laughs> sort of disaster information center, which hopefully is okay with some um, extra power. So we are working with a power company who will bring the emergency power unit. Interestingly, we had some examination of the site the other day as a preparation, mm -hmm. and I went there around after five, which is getting dark. And of, co of course we have the, uh, in the exercise, we will have the power, emergency power. And they said, you can connect 20 PCs, no problem. Then I went there, it's a local um, village almost. And they had their own power so we can turn it on if things are normal, but if not, bring in the um, emergency power, how do you illuminate? There's no lamps, lights, extra. It's, it's an abundant school. So they still have the illuminations in the ceilings, but you cannot bring this extra emergency power to connect to that without having good technology or stuff. So you, we need some kind of st you know, small stand, lights and stuff. These are, can be easily overlooked. Water is another thing, but uh, in any case, we are, we are trying to raise awareness by actually doing something rather than just a simulation kind of thing. Um, we are almost close to the end of the allocated hours. Um, you have any more comments? Or would you like to show? A fi final cut? Okay. Um, the huh? Yeah, uh, a, a few more minutes, five more minutes we have. Um, if, if I may, um, here's my short observation or we'll take out of your discussions. It's randomly put. The use of wireless is one thing that we almost have in common uh, more effective in the case of emergencies, but how do you deploy this kind of wireless in a normal sort of situation um, with some economic um, sustainability could be perhaps a challenge. I challenged Nokia guy, CTO, last year in Kenya, Nairobi's um, session on emerging issues that, yes, a lot of people scream that they really wanted to talk to your daughter when they are concerned of course, the traffic prevented them, that 95% was traffic was regulated or not go through. And he said, oh, it's, I mean, it's impossible to prepare that much redundancy. It's, it's economically not feasible. I said, well, a few years ago, our bandwidth is far smaller per unit, and still we could talk. Now we can do a lot more video or whatever with this machine. So when the, the emergency comes in, can't we regulate something to use the technology to allow more people to do basic things, but not maybe browsing or so. So these are the kind of innovation, maybe backwards innovation, but uh, to, to share the scarce resources should be very important to explore because 
the same time, um, compared with 10 years ago, our life is very much dependent on ICP, if not internet, mobile, everywhere you go, right? And the, all these man-made facilities are vulnerable to the natural disaster. And as our society develops economically in Afghanistan, India, so we have many more man-made things to the nature. And nature always roams back <laughs> and destroy so that the sort of new infrastructure built on these new ICPs will be very, uh, very vulnerable, actually, than the old robust paper or uh, that kind of communication system. And I, I see that we are not quite ready to really protect these new kind of infrastructures. As I said, some, I spoke with some of the first respondents or first e many experts in the disaster reduction areas, but few knows about the latest technology uh, that, that the Twitter or others are using. That's my kind of second observation. Another thing is geo important geographical information. Uh, I have done another research on the, the websites who try to save or give relief to in Japan. And the highest type of data they used is geographical information. And the next one was um, this, the email data and the stuff like that. But so on the so we, we see the trend that mashup is another thing. Uh, we are doing some big data mashup exercise with Google and Twitter and all combined. And um, last perhaps but not least is perhaps the preparedness uh, is propelled by the exercise. Um, you have to really constantly refresh and you are showing the precedence and the curve also. What's a pity, what is pity is these are not really internationally shared yet, perhaps. I didn't know anything about what's going on in Sweden or, or you know, Indonesia other than coming to IGF. <laughs> so I think the IGF is a good platform. It's a pity that we didn't have too many people, but this will be recorded and shared. Um, any other final comment? Welcome. Dallas? Yeah, I think just uh, several things like the preparation, coordination, uh, skills also. I think it's still the basic needs we need for the uh, disaster reliefs yeah. in terms of the technology I think we still have to remember the basic things <laughs> how we can survive I mean the coordination preparation some other things anything no, I think it's important what you highlighted there is this uh, capacity building and sharing of, of experience is very important and, and it's a valid point that these exercises are not shared, and, and I mean, even inside Europe, this is still only now starting to be shared. So it's uh, that's very important to 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 learn from each other. I guess my last comment is uh, we should look for ways to use and test technologies that will be useful in disaster relief in times when there are no disasters. To your point, so that people are not are comfortable and knowledgeable about ad hoc communications because they've used them in moments when there wasn't an emergency. I think the, uh, the preparedness is the most important, I think. And uh, the next one is the, uh, the sharing the information uh, like this. And uh, the third one is the, the IP network is only, I think that this is uh, the, the, the answer for her, I think, uh, is the uh, most cheapest and uh, uh, so many devices we have so that is the only uh, really? media, I think. The mobile phones are more. Yeah, but uh, we, we have to, uh, depends on the right. big mm -hmm. okay. big tower and the uh, yeah. uh, cap. It's expensive. Yeah. Yes. Uh, if I may, my last word is actually I, conquer, well, I counter with the preparedness thing myself. Many things happen beyond your preparation, beyond your assumption, and many people got just stuck and don't know what to do with that's what happened to the nuclear power plant thing or tsunami thing in Japan physically and we are doing some role playing that to give very different situation that you can imagine and psychological training of, of sort is also very interesting and also go beyond the boundary of the existing organizations Th these organizations tend to stay back to the normal system of decision making, even though in the catastrophic situation, which was have been observed not only in Japan, but some of the Thailand, other areas, 
especially the governments. So I think for that we need different kind of exercise of preparation than conventionally exercise. Thank you very much with that. I'd like to close this workshop. Thank you so much.